Welcome back. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com, and this is Raise Your Average. Co-hosting with me is my castmate, Mike Philbrick, Chief Executive Officer at Resolve Asset Management Global. Mike, what's going on? Well, I'm hanging in there. These are exciting times. I think it's 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 really interesting now too because um, and and really excited to have Paul on to talk about how investors can navigate these current times. I think something that um, you know I've been on the road and talking with advisors and allocators and what we do, and something that's coming up all over and over again is this this different regime that's kicked in since December thirty first, twenty twenty one, where we've had a very different character of inflation. And what I point to is this is inflation volatility. Inflation was transitory. Now it's not transitory, or maybe it is transitory again. And the challenge is when we have these adjustments in inflation expectations, and remember it's all about the expectation, which then filters down to the adjustments in asset prices, we set new trends and we set uh, uh, new opportunities in the marketplace. And this dispersion allows for active managers and people who are going to be taking a look at the markets through a lens of whether it's got trend, whether it's got relative momentum, they're going to be able to add significant value if they do it correctly and thoughtfully, likely add significant value over sort of the index weighted products that we've seen over the last decade. We're also going to see this dispersion spread across further and wider asset classes and individual stocks. So, you know, you've got to have a lens to think about that through, whether it's at the top level of asset allocation, we dig down deeper into asset allocation into different areas of stocks and bonds and commodities and alternatives. And so, you know, SAA charts to me has a really good, thoughtful way to think through that. And then just point and figure charting generally kind of gets rid of the noise a bit. So I'm I'm interested to to dig in with Paul today (laughs) and and kind of, you know, provide some some, uh, insights. And I think now is a really important time, actually. You've got to, you know, investors got to give their heads a shake, get out of this sort of 60, 40, I don't need to do anything anymore. It's, we're not in Kansas now. This is a kind of a different regime. It has different implications for asset prices, and it's going to create some opportunities for those who've got, you know, framework to, to go through that uh, change with and profit by. That's a great intro, Mike. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Our guest this episode is Paul Kornfeld, president at SIA Charts. Like, who better than to talk about SIA Charts than the, the man himself? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pierre. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you guys having me on again. It's the yeah. second time on and, and happy to discuss the markets and kind of where things are going because every day, every every month right now is is uh, the, the markets are rocking with news or, or, you know, there's hawkish holes, there's governments, inflations and banking crisis. So we're we're in for it this year, it seems like. It's, um, it's one of those you can't sit back at all. Just like last year, you got to you're going to fight hard in this market. Um, and, and like you said, but there is opportunities, right? And so that's one of the things that we, we try to help advisors uh, find both from a top-down approach and also, you know, within the, the stock market or, or fund market, if that's what they're looking for. You got a lot of new stuff going on there, right? I mean, um, we're, first of all, welcome again. And, and thanks for coming on the show. It's great to have you. Um, what's new in uh, the kingdom of SIA charts? What's going on there? There's there's always stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, one of the biggest, you know, probably website kind of relaunches we're we're doing probably this week. Um, hence, you know, talked to you beforehand. You know, there's just a lot going on behind the scenes. We're really excited about that. We're working on um, kind of a know your product tool for advisors as well, with really in depth um, and quick printouts. You know, kind of almost fact sheets for any stocks, ETS, funds, as well as kind of a, a quick and powerful comparison tool. And just a way for advisors um, all across Canada to you know, keep track of those important holdings in, in one place. And so we're excited to roll that out here this spring as well. And then adding more, more market intelligence. We've really tried to move towards a market intelligence platform. Um, we're never going to be the Bloombergs of the world, but we want to create a really powerful portfolio management service 
as well as in in depth and quick analysis. Uh, it's hard to do both, right? It's hard to provide very quick and powerful analysis, but also the in depth for advisors that want to go deeper um, within that. So we'll be rolling out news, uh, fundamentals, you know, just different uh, analysis. We've, we've mostly historically been on the technical side, but we want to create a tool that's really appealing to to everybody. Um, again, from a, a, sh a shallow but powerful analysis layer and also in depth. And that's a little bit of what we're going to go into, I think, today is yeah, yeah. talk about the different sectors and, and where we're the best to be best positioned here going forward, but also, you know, get into the chart and get into, you know, we use point and figure and charting analysis and why is that important and why is that different than anybody else? But um, yeah, there's a, a lot to get into and excited to do it with you guys. Well, I, you know, like we, Paul, Paul, how long have we known you? Was that f like 14 years? Yeah, probably. Right? Something like that? Been, I yeah. can't believe it. We, we've, we've covered, we have, we have, we have republished and shared 14 years of your daily charts. Um, but, you know, I, I, the reason I brought that up, uh, other than the fact that we've known you for a long time, I, 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 I think the last, you know, Mike, the last, what, the last 10, 12 years have been sort of like, you know, this, this blur of, you know, zero interest rates and, and non you know, sort of unimportant fundamentals. So, I mean, I think that might have played really well for you too. I mean, at your end, Paul, in terms of technicals, just because, you know, people were looking for confirmation on, on what they were doing, even though, you know, the market was just going, you know, up and up and up for, for that entire, you know, duration with a few interruptions here and there. Um, nobody was really paying a lot of attention to fundamentals during that time, right? I mean, it, it, if you did, it I mean, it didn't hurt if you did, but but some people might have said that was a waste of time in hindsight. Well, it, you um, know, it, on the fundamentals, if you if you went the value route, um, yeah. you know, you had better better yeah. fundamentals, but the charts were saying yeah. to you that there was no momentum there, so no so confirmation. I, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things that that you know, I've been a big fan of of that type of charting. It's not exactly what we use. We you know, we we're obviously using price when we're in the markets quite heavily. There are other factors to consider, but when you're when you're looking at the world of stocks and bonds, and you're looking through the lens of of price, um, you, you do want to have that fundamental. I will call it an underlay because you want to you want to look at what's fundamentally good. But you you know they don't put the fundamentals on the statement for the client. They yeah. put what the NAV is at the end of the month, and so there can be this pretty significant gap between fundamentals and and performance. And I think. What's really key at this critical moment is there has now been a shift or a change or we could be going on, we could be seeing a shift or change in the leadership. There certainly was a change in leadership. It's now shifting back a little bit to, you know, these mega cap tech plays. The challenge is people get caught and investors get caught in a narrative and they don't necessarily have an exit plan. And so part of managing risk, I think, is having an exit plan, having a way that you're going to rebalance things. And when we get in these transitionary periods between regimes where you have this conflict between leadership, this is where it gets kind of hard and it really pays to have tools that can help you adjust your narrative. Most times people's narratives don't adjust until price has already started to decline, momentum's lost, and they're not, they're not updating their priors, if you will. And I think that, you know, Paul, you, you walk us through it. I mean, I'm sure you've got, uh, you know, sort of reams of data and all the little clues that build the mosaic for you to say, yeah, you know, there's been a shift. Um, you know, the, the sort of equal weight versus uh, market cap weighted stuff. And the S&P is kind of an interesting one to keep keep an eye on. Small caps versus large caps, value mm -hmm. versus growth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th there's fundamentals. I like, you know, I generally think fundamentals are are the the, you know, they're not the top layer. You, you want to see good fundamentals, but you want to see price confirming, you know, strangers confirming that your view of the fundamentals are, are you know, correct to some degree. So yeah, yeah, pa yeah. Paul, it was it was, it was a crazy quarter, wasn't it? I mean, your your you know your most recent sector scopes showed you know how leadership changed from one month to the next over the last three months. That there was, um, I mean, we had Fed tightening, we had, you know, inflation becoming stickier, banking crisis happened, um, 
We have, we've got a bull steepening yield curve right now. There's been a rally in tech for the last quarter. It's still, you know, it's continuing, uh, although very narrowly and, uh, you know, bad market breadth. And um, really, I, I mean, also the current earnings season seems to be probably, the, uh, you know, a hotly anticipated earnings decline. Uh, I don't know if that's hotly anticipated, but everybody's expecting it. And, um, you know, and technicals have been defiant. So um, what's your, first of all, what's your take on things? And secondly, let, let, let's get into the sector scopes as well. So you can sort of show us sure. graphically what's happened. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we kind of come out with a quarterly outlook and, and recap, and, and we called it the winter of discontent for the world markets, right? You just basically listed everything that happened the first quarter of the year. Um, as Fed across the, the world start tightening um, or, or pausing, right? Like there's, there's more expectations for um, inflation to come down and with those, you know, kind of cautious optimism going forward. But historically, you know, the May, June kind of months of, of the year are, are usually not the most positive uh, to start, um, right? Like yeah. it's, you know, if you look at seasonality and things like that, it's, it's a, a, you definitely want to be a little cautious. There is more expectations, like you said, on the earnings side of things, because um, you even see earnings beat, and you know the the stocks aren't, you know, really delivering the outperformance that you would be hoping with that kind of result, right? There's, they're kind of focusing on that negative news, um, and we are seeing more divergence within the, the sectors, right? So um, we'll get into that here as well and take a look at the sector scopes, um, kind of visually for those watching. Um, and not just listening, we're going to probably do quite a bit of visual work on, on this podcast just because uh, we can kind of um, see it a little bit better than just talk about it at high level. So, yeah, we kind of talk about it as the winter discontent and, you know, that kind of cautious optimism going forward. Um, also kind of, you know, we're not as bullish on, on Canada right now. Uh, we're more on the international kind of U.S. side of things, uh, especially in the international side. And, and that's been our top asset class since, I think, November um, and we've been kind of more bullish in, in general with our equity action call, kind of a risk management tool um, towards equities, but that's now come down to kind of a tipping point as well. So I'm happy to get into that and yeah. kind of how it's calculated. But again, it's that kind of just ca cautious optimism. There's a lot of negative news and negative kind of headwinds out there, but also, you know, while there's still Fed money out there and inflation pressures, there's still that need for um, potential raising or, or um, at least not from, you know, reducing rates. Like we're still kind of in that in that increasing, especially around the world, especially in England, where there's still a lot more inflation pr um, pressure than in, in North America. Right, you're going to see that continuation of uh, the Fed's raising rate in the Bank of England. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm happy maybe to uh, share my I'm screen just, here. Want, one Sorry, thing but, before you do that, I'm just wondering, you know, if this highly anticipated Fed pause. Is 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 you know this consensus that there seems to be that there's going to be a pause in 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 hiking. Um, that may be correct, but there's also uh, you, you know what if it's not? What if what if it's, yeah. what if inflation is actually more persistent than people realize, and and that's that ends up being a surprise. I don't know what the odds are of something like that, but. Um, you know, the other thing is there seems to be an anticipation that Fed cutting will come sooner than it possibly will, even despite, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of warnings from economists that that, you know, don't expect it until probably 24. But um, anyways, I think what you I, I just wonder what, your, what more, your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think you see a lot more Fed um, action than you have, you know, even going back 15 years ago to kind of the global financial crisis. Right. Um, even back in 2020 or 2016, right, you have different times where the Fed stepped in um, either to work with other governments to devalue their currency and to um, potentially avoid a crisis. Then in 2016 and 2020, you see them meeting on a Sunday to, uh, to provide bailouts. I mean, when's the last time they met on a weekend, right? Like you, you see the action. And then recently in March, um, them come in very quickly again, either what I think that was over the weekend or the next Monday. Um, for the, you know, the banking crisis, right, with uh, the regional banks and then over in, in Europe with Credit Suisse, like you, you just, or Credit Suisse, um, you just, you see that federal kind of influence and, um, you know, what do you call it, bailout money or whatever, but like just influence on the markets uh, much 
quicker than anticipated. I think that's one of the things um, somebody mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast of how you need to continue to involve, right? I think that was Mike in your introduction, mm-hmm. right? Like every time's different. Like history re- doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, right? We've got to learn from it, we've got to adapt. And that's something that we, we're trying to do and we're trying to advise um, our clients and, and everybody else out there too, that you can't take the same approach, right? You can't, you have to learn and say, okay, well, there's way more AI trading. There's way more algorithmic trading out there than ever before. So you see a March of 2020, uh, how quickly that volatility can happen and how quickly it can bounce back. Like usually that 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 downswing would, would last much longer, but now we have the fastest bear market in history and the fastest rebound in history, right? So, okay, what's it gonna be next? We, we don't know. These inflation pressures, I think, you know, probably will stay longer than anticipated. And, you know, we won't have decreased rates as, as fast as maybe people presume. But again, that's just an opinion. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it, it's going to change tomorrow when we talk again or something, right? Like it's, it's, there's all this information out there. So all you have to do is, like you said, have some tools that help you sift through that information, reduce the noise so that you can try to figure out how to best position yourselves going forward. Because you don't even need to be right all those times. We need to do is make sure you're not blowing up your portfolio, not, um, and just by you know staying away from some of those areas, like the banks, right, um, which are our lowest sector, no surprise, <laughs> and we're one of our lowest sectors at that time. Nobody in our system would have been had that exposure to, um, you know, SIVB and, and some of those uh, regional banks, First Republic, like, you know, it's just kind of following the money, and there was lots of hints before that uh, came out to stay away from that. So that that's what you can do to, to raise your average to, to overall just yeah. stay away from the things that will, will blow you up. So you don't even need to have all those huge wins out there. I don't think there's going to be a lot of big wins out there. You have to, you have to be pretty tactical. I think it's potentially going to give rise a little bit more to maybe the active manager outperforming, you know, kind of the passive indexes during this time, because it's, it's, it's very mega cap weighted right now, but what if that doesn't work out going forward? Right. Um, every day you, you hear about new, um, you know, job losses in, in every sector and every, especially tech and all the major, um, and I was watching some, some uh, other podcasts and they just basically for five minutes listed out all the job losses of all the major companies out there, right? Like that's kind of where we're at and especially in the U.S. Um, yet the, the market's still strong, you know, the market is still in, um, inflated in that way, but you know, that, that usually raises stock valuation if there's 15 percent less employees they have to pay going forward and, and still good valuations. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's really interesting, the, the market versus the market, if you will. <laughs> so the market cap weighted market, I saw something today. I think I think it's Apple is now the largest single position in the S&P 500 ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, taking out uh, you know, IBM back in the eighties, I guess it was. So, you know, speak of a, you know, speak about a concentrated market. Okay. We have a concentrated market. Um, but you know, there's, there's other stocks that are underlying the market. They may have the opportunity to perform better or worse. And, and, you know, this is some of what we want to talk about today. So how do you sift through all of that, Paul, how do you sift through the changing central bank policy? Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic than most. I think that, you know, Fed cuts will come sooner and larger, and that's not good. Like that, that, that whole, the whole pray mm-hmm. for the pivot thing is, is, is kind of a novel thing to me, just because historically, when you get the pivot, it means shit's gone really wrong. Yeah. And you don't get the pivot from like, oh, everything's fine. And we're just going to, you know, juice asset prices, especially when um, central banks are forced to be very concerned with inflation and the, and you know, housing inflation is a part of that, which then leads into mortgage rates and what's happened with banking has provided lower interest rates, which has provided more, uh, boost to housing prices. And that's kind of not what they're looking to do. But anyway, so we've got this fantastic mosaic of all kinds of things in the background. And so, Paul, why don't you help us like sort of top down? How are you thinking about, you know, through the markets, maybe through a bit of an asset allocation waterfall and then into the, you know, sort of sector or regional or country waterfall, how you guys process that? Is that, is that a good jumping off point for that at this point? Yeah. And let me know, Pierre, when you can see my screen here, I think it's just going to be sure. loading, but it'll give you exactly um, kind of that viewpoint of, okay, where are we at from a high level? Um, where are opportunities kind of from a 
you know, an asset class or sector level. And then um, we can kind of go from there too. So again, I kind of hinted at this, but over the last couple of years, we have been a little bit more cautious in the market. Um, this kind of risk management tool up here at the top is literally asking one question. Should we be in equities or should we be looking elsewhere? Um, and so, you know, kind of for all of 2021, we were looking at, um, you know, staying in the markets um, with commodities and, and different areas being at where we were looking at. Then starting kind of 2022, we got a lot more cautious um, and, you know, and, and helping advisors reduce their overall risk. It wasn't a great year in the markets, the worst 60, 40 year, whatever, since the 1930s or something. Um, like it was, uh, you know, an area where we were staying away from fixed income. Literally, I talked to kind of about that of even at a value add just from a top down asset class point. So if you can see on the screen, if not, I'll just kind of verbally talk about it. Yeah, but we can see it. All through 2022, fixed income was either our sixth or seventh ranked asset class through the whole time period. Um, and getting into this year, it still isn't as strong as, you know, we would hope it to be. But, um, you know, it's it's got to bounce back at some point, but it still hasn't really moved up into that upper tier where we're kind of screaming to to get back into that asset class. Uh, as it's had its own kind of volatility uh, lately. So even just that, it's not a sexy thing to talk about fixed income and bonds, but it's been one of our biggest calls over the last year or so of just, hey, stay away from this. And um, we would rather be in cash or commodities or even in the markets than, than the fixed income sector a lot of the times. Now, since did the you guys, beginning did, of this year. Paul, sorry. did you guys, did you have a um, any any signal on your, on your relative strength system uh, for bonds? like for longer duration, like TLT or, or a longer, a long bond ETF index, anything yeah. that, that, that showed that, that, you know, longer duration bonds were, I'm just curious, just since we're on the, on your screen here, for what, sure. you know, what was the, um, what were the signals like for the long bond at the beginning of the year? Sure. So yeah, we can dive into that here. So at the beginning of the year, uh, if I kind of change the, the ending date here, Go back to well, 30th. Um, so fixed income was kind of our last ranked uh, asset class. It has moved up since then. And kind of the long um, bonds or long term, if I could spell, would have been, you know, one of our lowest ranked asset class. Now that has moved up over time. But uh, again, <clears throat> that was kind of where we were staying away from is all of 2022 just staying away from the fixed income side of things. So I guess that was uh, November that I went to, kind of jumping right. back to today. Now we can see within the fixed income asset class that um, this is kind of looking at US um, more so. I can switch over to Canada here as well. But again, none of these are ranked that that highly, but on the long side, again, it's all the way down here at the bottom. So it's always been more short um, side of things, corporate, high yield, still preferred stock. Um, but none of these are really jumping off the the page. We're still rather be an international value stocks, things like that, trying to point people in the right direction from a sector standpoint. So again, what we're trying to do here is just point people in the right direction. International has had a good start to the year, uh, just like tech right. and in the US, things like that. And in Canada is, is ranked below cash in our rankings, which is kind of its own kind of negative outlook. So Mike, we might be on the same page there of, you know, we're not the most bullish on our system right now, even though, again, overall, we're kind of green. We're at that kind of tipping point where, um, you know, unless there's some some changes in the market, it, it looks to potentially weaken um, even further here going forward. Now, what's going into this, uh, Paul? Like, is, is it uh, price? Is it price momentum? Is, is it got some other factors like seasonality? What? What's the mosaic of, of things that are going into this line that is that is giving us these ranks? Maybe the, the, I think some insight sure. there would probably be helpful for for watchers and listeners. Yeah. So what what we try to focus on is the underlying supply and demand relationship. Um, so you know, just taking two basic concepts like stocks for spawn. So if we look at an S and P five hundred ETF versus a U.S. You know, aggregate bond ETF. Um, we look at that from a point and figure standpoint, a comparison standpoint, and we just really have them fight it out. Like think of it a boxing match, right? Like just one of those is going to win. Um, in this case, U.S. equity is above fixed income. So we know which one is winning that battle. Sometimes it's a lot bigger battle versus international versus commodities like energy. Um, 
it's going to be a much bigger divergence there, right, between that battle. So we, we just do that head-to-head -head comparison using point and figure comparison charts behind the scenes. I'm happy to pull some of that up and, and walk you through that as well. I know we wanted to go there in, in the, the long run here of the podcast, but it's just as that simple. We want, we're trying to look at the supply and demand. Does it matter what goes into that, what the technicals say, what its moving averages are, what its fundamentals are? Not, not really, because all that comes back to how people feel about that in the current market and therefore that supply and demand relationship. Is there more supply, is there more demand? That's going to point it in the right direction. And the, the unique thing about it is you just have to do that peer comparison lots of times against each other. And we do that from a high level up here when we're talking about equities, our versa asset classes. We're looking at different asset classes behind the scenes doing that using ETFs um, is, the I guess, the secret sauce uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we're doing ETF comparisons for asset class rankings and our sector rankings over here. Also for MFDA advisors or people using mutual funds, we can also do that on that side as well. Um, cool. But for asset class kind of standpoint, we're doing using that to just do those comparisons. Uh, we do 10 billion comparisons every single day um, or cal 10 billion calculations and hundreds of millions of point and figure comparisons to come up with this system, but it's not a day trading system. We don't have no idea what the market's gonna do the rest of this week. <laughs> All we're right. looking for is those longer trends, that six to 18 month outlook because that's, from our viewpoint, kind of the time frame that our advisors that are using us are looking at and, you know, can best position going forward. Because usually the longer term trends of the market, should I be in energy or not? Should I be in U.S. over Canada? Some of those are decade long calls, right? These aren't necessarily um, the sector calls will change much, much faster. We can take a look at both the sector rankings and the sector scopes that are, are more kind of looking at. Um, money move flowing in and out of the markets, and then that changes kind of every every week, uh, well every day, but every week you kind of see those bigger trends. But this kind of top down approach is just to get us pointing in the right direction. So when I'm working with an advisor, I'm saying, well, let's look at an international strategy first before we really dive into Canada, because you know over the last, um, I don't know, this is kind of since the equity action call went green in November of, of 2022, the international markets are up about 10 percent. And Canada's, you know, barely above zero, 1.6, and the U.S. is slightly above it. So you can see our asset class rankings. International was the top one, U.S. and then Canada in, the, in that order, and that's exactly kind of how it's played out. Not not always how we want to see it, but international, just on the short term, over the last six months, has been the, the right call and, and continues to be kind of how it's best positioned right now going forward. So that's that's kind of the more macro calls we're looking at. It's just a simple... Yeah. kind of comparison chart like this, but how we do it is hundreds of thousands and millions of comparisons behind the scenes to c hopefully simplify where you should be spending your time. Because it's all about that that's, efficiency. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's you, you might not, as an advisor or an investor, you might not be paying it. I mean, we're talking about an advisor tool here, but as an advisor, you might not be paying attention to international equity because you're being diverted by everything else that you own. And and then, but when you look at the equity action call and and then the breakdown of it, you know, you dive into it like like you just did. Um, it draws your attention to the assets that you're not even thinking of that you should be. Yeah, so that's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think the other thing here that that's really important. So what I'm picking up is it's this relative game. It's relative strength, mm -hmm. and so we're looking yeah. at price and we're looking at those that are relatively stronger than others in the sector space. And I think that. Uh, just take a moment to explain a little bit of why that's so important. So, um, and I'm, I'm recalling the numbers here, but we, we have a research report we did on this type of thing. And it kind of looked at, hey, what did emerging managers provide for 10 years of return? This is going back a few years, but it was, it was very small. It was a de minimis compound rate of return. I'm going to make it up, but call it 2% over a decade. Yeah. U.S. Yeah. equities returned 10% or 12% or whatever it was. So the decision, if you went into emerging markets, the average market did 2%, let's say the average manager did 2%. For the exceptional manager in emerging markets to have provided the average performance of the US equity market, they had to be the top percentile. Mm -hmm. They had to be the best emerging market manager in the whole field to equal what the average US manager did. Yeah. Yeah. And so understanding the 
the asset allocation waterfall and then the sector waterfall. And then, you know, figuring out as an advisor how much you can tilt a portfolio to take advantage of those tactical weights versus, you know, your strategic weight and, and your dynamic weightings mm -hmm. is something that, you know, you're thinking about the tracking here potentially of the client and how will they be able to stick with the program. So this is where it becomes very important for the advisor to have that first-hand knowledge, uh, advisor of allocator, the first-hand knowledge of the end client or asset user or owner. Well, but it's, and, it and, can't and how be many, understated yeah. how important it is, right? If you were smart enough, or if you were just reading the tea leaves, if if uh, if you will, you will, if you were looking at relative strength and noted that U.S. markets had been substantially stronger for a persistent period of time, and so allocated more there and a little bit less to emerging, and maybe you kept some. And that's the point. No emerging manager could perform as well as the average U.S. manager. We're sort of in those similar circumstances. It's interesting to see the international side pick up now, yep. but that's a story that's being missed. Most people are not seeing that. Right? How many, not yeah, seeing that. That's what I was just going to say. How many investors thought last year in the fall or the summer, I'm going to, I'm going to buy Europe because it's cheap. <laughs> you know, it's down. It's, yeah. You know, like, no, that was, you know, that was a bet that most people wouldn't have even contemplated because of the war. Yeah. I mean, it's still because of energy, you know, because of oh, energy, yeah. because like the, the energy vulnerability, because of the war that's going on, all the activity that's happening there, you know, and then, you know, Europe's tiny when you look at it, you know, in, in very close proximity, there's, a, there's, you know, there's a war going on and, and, um, but there it is right there. Number, you know, first in the first, in the pole position. European stocks, yeah, <laughs> right. That that just defies what most people think they should have done. They look, they're yeah, going to look at that and they're going to be like stupefied, like what? You know, if I mean, when they wake up and realize, like, I could have just been, I could have, I could have picked up on this signal and gotten into European stocks. Anyways, I don't want to ramble on about it, but that's pretty interesting. I know. Yeah. France is up 20% over the last year and, and, uh, you know, S&P is down 1%. <laughs> France. Go figure. Yeah. Go I figure, mean, right? There's France. a goddamn, there's like, like the worst riot going on there with, you know. <laughs> I know, right? it's, it's I mean, crazy. you know, all you see in the news is, is, you know, people rioting in the street, right? Uh, and Mike, at, yeah. Mike, to your point, like you, um, like over, you know, 2000, 2010, like if you're in Canadian equity over the U.S., that was the right call. And, and the top 10 percent or sorry, the bottom 10 percent of Canadian mutual fund managers outperform the top 10 percent of U.S. fund managers by a wide margin. I think it's at 5 percent delta, even between the worst and the best. And then mm -hmm. it flipped over the last decade from kind of 2010, more maybe 2012 onwards for the next decade. It was, it was flip-flopped. You would rather be in the U.S. versus Canada. And again, there's that delta in between. So maybe going forward, we have international for the next decade. Again, not making any predictions, but, you know, there there is always opportunities out there. And, and we launched this new tool called the ETF Country Heat Map to kind of visually see this, right? Who, That's cool. Who thought that uh, Turkey would be the best place to be over the last year? Well, our system hopefully points you in that right direction or, or some other areas like France, <laughs> which you <laughs> wouldn't necessarily uh, look into. And Russia was the big minus 80% on here until it got basically delisted <laughs> um, uh, uh, places to stay away from right within the system. So uh, it's pretty interesting and then kind of see it over different time frames and things like that um, on the system really try to, again, point you in the right direction. So, again, we just looked at, um, you know, Europe developed as that top kind of sector in the top asset class. And now you're visually kind of seeing it. It's been more in Europe than China and other places that we would have hoped kind of really provide that bounce back in the market. So just some different visual tools in um, this SI rank uh, score is uh, not based on the performance, but based on taking this, you know, France as a country and comparing it against all the other countries and all the other areas that you could be in and a higher score is, is better for us. So this kind of says that any of these names up here are, are where you want to be. And even with Switzerland's Credit Suisse, banking crisis and all that, it's still actually performed yeah. much better than you would think um, over that time frame. And again, it kind of is contrary to what you're hearing in the news and other things. So we try to provide that unbiased yeah. um, approach and, and just information to help people point them in the right direction.
No, this is the Overton window, right? The Overton window of belief of, of you've gotten in the habit of North American markets doing very well over the last decade. And yeah. that is not the case. It certainly hasn't been over the last 12 months. But if you were to ask somebody where the performance is, they would probably point to by habit to what they've owned, what they know, like, and trust so well. And this is about updating your priors, having some way to understand things have changed. And when nobody else is talking about it, it often means that there's a lot of money that has to proceed in that direction. And I think that we were tied, I mentioned this, you're looking for the confirmation of strangers, if you will. We are seeing some initial movers. You don't get to a 20% return over the last year in France yeah. by money not flowing to France. Money yeah. is flowing to France. The supply and dynamics are such that the money is flowing so that the prices are going up. And that's happening more than in the US. So They're not talking about up. it on CNBC. Well, precisely. Um, and yeah. they won't. When they do start to talk yeah. about it, now you're kind of in the middle of the trend. <laughs> you know, yeah. and when they're talking about it every day, it might be at the end of the trend, but I'm not, you know, all of those things now become the, you know, the, the, um, the nuance of it where it, you, you have to have a little bit more expertise and a little bit more insights to handle the, the edge cases uh, where, where, you know, it's been going up for a long time or it's been going down for a long time. This is um, kind of like having a, a, you know, a totally like you, you called it strangers, Mike. I like that. <laughs> but uh, this is like having a totally unbiased friend who's incredibly well informed tell you without any emotionality, you know, like systematically, mm -hmm. you know, look over here, look over there. You know, these these other places are yeah. signaling something that you're not paying attention to. And and at the terms, it's hard. Right. Because you've yeah. got something that's, you know, coming from low and getting up high. You've got something from high that's rolling over and, and, you know, there's a bit of mismatch, mishmash in there. So, you know, this is where you, you, you're trying to ascertain what, what's the group of fish. I'm trying to get a school of fish. I'm not trying to find a fish, but you know, I can see the schools of fish here that might be swimming together for whatever reason, macroeconomic or otherwise. Yeah. Um, and then, but again, you can come back to, well, I have a tracking error to address. I, my client wants X amount in Canada for some reason, or feels, yeah. you know, drawdowns well, like his friends do because he's in, in the Canadian equity market, this whole home country bias or whatever you want to talk about from the behavioral side. But at least now you have some tools to point to some facts that give you some confidence in, you know, expanding the canvas that you might be uh, dealing with and helping the, the client sort of get their heads around that too. Um, because, you know, you say, oh, I want to sell my, you know, I want to sell the S&P 500, which has this, all these beautiful tech companies in it. And I want to buy the, the, the French CAC index and people will be like, what CAC sounds exactly like I, I think something I don't want to do. <laughs> and it's, it's not to say you can't still make money being in the U S right. It's still up on the Agreed. year. It's still, you said, if you're overweight in tech or, or things like mm -hmm. that, like you can still, you know, find strength yeah. within there. Um, but the big picture is always important. I think sometimes, like you said, people get too focused in on just their area or especially within Canada, right? There's so much more out there as we become more of a global economy every single day. Uh, we're more connected. Like your, this computer that we're talking on is probably built in over 40 different countries, all the components and things, right? So like yep. we saw the supply chain disruption. We saw when things can go wrong, but also there's so many things that are affected now globally. And, and there's like there's still a, a war going on right beside the top, some of the top performers in, in yeah. Europe. And, and that's still, there's macro things and OPEC and all this other stuff still going yeah. on. It, it doesn't mean that we ignore them, but it doesn't mean we don't follow the money, right? The money flows here that we're tracking provide opportunities and provide uh, things or countries that have been beaten down or undervalued in some ways, or that are bouncing back in different ways or not dealing with inflation the same way. Like Japan is not, dealing with inflation like we are in, in North America or Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these numbers are shocking to me, but doesn't mean that we can't again put that aside and, and try to make the best decisions we can uh, to overall kind of have a better portfolio. So yep. they don't they don't really shock me at all. But you know, <laughs> but doing, doing this for a long time, this is what happens and you see it often. Um, the other thing that I think and you mentioned this earlier, Paul, and I, I don't think it can be understated. 
chasing the top of the pyramid, as Paul showed, um, is one way to add some extra value to the portfolio. But the yeah. greater way is avoiding what's on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And when you avoid having that dead money or having those, those uh, pieces of the portfolio that are down substantially, by default, you are in the other things that are not as down substantially. And that is probably as big a value add, especially in the space that we're talking about with advisors and allocators and at the speed at with which they will make transactions and adjustments. That is probably the larger add is just staying out of trouble. Absolutely. And and small decisions can make a big impact, right? If you have a normally a 10% weighting international equity, we're not saying to move that up to 90 and get rid of Canada and the US. It might mean a, an extra 5%, an extra 10% to, to stand out and to hopefully reduce your overall risk. And that just might mean, okay, let's add, instead of buying France, go buy a developed ETF that gives you uh, Europe exposure, right? Or, right. or um, you know, again, maybe staying away from China, or again, maybe there's a good bounce back opportunity there. So keep an eye on it, you know, do some more research. We can point you in the right direction, but um, we can do the same thing on the sectors. And that's kind of what I have up here as well. And Pierre, something that you want to, to take a look at. And, um, you know, what this chart is doing is looking at kind of overbought levels over here on the far right-hand side of, of, of sectors that probably over the next kind of, you know, three weeks, four weeks kind of are, are probably, again, in the overbought territory. So that means that um, more likely it's going to come down to the middle uh, at some point. And then if something is all the way down here, it's oversold. Uh, again, it has really no relation to one company um, per se, like an Apple. Right. Like it's it, it's just kind of giving you an overall kind of scope of, okay, how do we feel about real estate? Well, it's right in the middle. We don't really have an opinion besides, you know, like obviously the interest rates are going to affect that and uh, a sector like utilities quite a bit. So to see that big divergence, you know, utilities maybe has a further way to, to fall in the short term than, than real estate does, right? So it just can help you visually see what's going on. And we what we do is we also color code them. So in the green, these are our highest relative strength ranked sectors. And then in the red are the, the ones that are uh, the lowest ranked. And again, doesn't mean right. that there's not good opportunities within here, but visually what we're trying to display here is kind of just the, the money flowing in and out of the markets. And uh, we take kind of a unique approach on it as well. We're looking at a North American uh, view and we're looking at the 50 most liquid names in each sector. So it's not it's not encompassing the whole media sector. It's not encompassing the whole banking sector. It is more large cap kind of names, but it's also trying to just give you what most people would actually be buying and selling and eliminate some of the noise of the smaller cap or micro cap markets, especially in Canada, that you probably wouldn't be into anyways, and just kind of looks at the overall picture. And so the interesting thing is if we go back a couple and months that, ago. The green, sorry. the green, green, yellow, red, that matches up along with your equity action call? Uh, no, it would match up with no? our sector relative strength reports. Okay. All right. So I'll show that yeah. in the, the next can, slide. Can here. I just, before you jump away, I just want to go back to that and see if I understand this sure. correctly. Because, so this is the shorter term sort of overbought, oversold. So what we'd want to do is probably be selling utilities because they're an overbought poor sector if we had an overweight in them or we were looking to reduce them, is that kind of, and then maybe we would yeah. say, oh, we wanna, we, wanna, we wanna put that into the wholesale type of thing, or we'd be looking for names in wholesale because that's got a better relative strength score, it's got a better trend, and thus we would wanna, we would wanna move to that, but you know, you don't wanna just sell when it's low and buy something, so this is giving you a little bit of more of that nuance where you say, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I've got utilities, I'm not loving them, mm -hmm. they've had a run, I've been meaning to move a little bit more, increase my wholesale exposure, and so I'd, I'd buy the green bar on the left and sell the right red bar on the right. Is it, is, am I picking up that relatively okay? Yeah, so all we're, we act, I actually don't find that this provides a lot of value per se, so I don't okay. wanna recommend this from a, a short-term standpoint of buying and selling because there's so many other factors. But what it does display is, are you buying if you want to get into, like you said, a utility company right now, it's probably the wrong time to enter into that right, position. You might right. want to wait till that sector pulls back from a better entry standpoint. Um, well, I, how I we guess feel what I'm about saying this, is yeah. if I wanted to reduce my utilities, yes, 
right? This is, this is, <clears throat> looks yeah. like, because I, and I'd want to reduce it because it's that red box. It's not giving me the, so I know I'm kind of in the wrong area and I'm looking for a time to lighten up. Yep. So I might lighten up there. And then when I'm looking to replace it, I'm probably looking for the stuff that's stronger, but on the, on the oversold side a little bit, like exactly. not, not a trading call, more yeah. of a portfolio waiting call. Like I yeah. want to wait a little yeah. bit more here and a little bit less so, there and then the timing. Like a, a tactical call. Yeah. So this is our six to 18 month outlook for the sectors. This is how we feel overall about utilities. And this is this ranking here versus other places I could be is my outlook and, and how I feel about it. Um, the kind of, again, that BPI level of, of where the bullish percent index that we were looking at is how I feel about utilities. Again, on that, like you said, on that kind of entry or exit point, is it overbought or oversold? That's what we're showing here. Um, so kind of mm -hmm. these two reports have to almost be viewed at the same time, because what we're saying is, okay, it's up on the short term, 5%. It probably will even out back to the middle as we, as we move on. So, you know, don't be getting into the hype of this. It's again, just normal market movement. It's again, different time period that's oversold, overbought. I mean, you go back to again, 2020, it's everything's one way or the other, right? So sometimes you can see divergences and opportunities. This is how I try to simplify it for uh, advisors as much as possible. We don't even get into that, but it can still be helpful just as kind of like where we at with the market. What's, you know, what's that kind of things? Cause then trends do what over the long haul day? they even out usually right mm -hmm. <laughs> they're not gonna if, if there is that kind of arbitrage or that opportunity for the long haul and something as unsexy as utilities it's people are going to find it um in this market and, and see that opportunity so that's all it's really saying is is kind of where are opportunities going forward and this visually just shows us and again if you go back at different time periods it, it can uh, kind of sway one way of the di direction or the other pretty right. quickly um to see when those opportunities are so here's again early February after the market had a great January to start off with and get, guess what happened with all the tech stocks, right? They just kind of came back to life a little bit and had a little bit of a sell off into the February, March. That's almost expected if you saw what happened in January, right? So that's all it's really trying to say. And it brought along the other sectors with them. Um, and then you see banking here. Uh, if we went into March, um, probably all the way on the left after the selling off, Okay, here you go, <laughs> right right down Amazing. here. Doesn't mean that that's the time to buy. There was still a lot of bad things going on, so it's not a great indicator necessarily or a predictor. It's just trying to show you the, the flow of the markets. So just you know, for people listening today or watching, all we're trying to say is it's, it's kind of normal. It's maybe skewed to the right a little bit if we go back to today, um, but there could be some concern in financials, insurance, utilities, healthcare, Glomerates are kind of in the oversold area on a very short term and probably should expect those kind of just come back to the middle. But you could you could use it as a confirmation tool, right? Like sure. if you're about to allocate money. Absolutely. Um, you know, allocate investment, then then you could you could go and look at the indications uh, of red and, and then, you know, use that as a hold off signal. Exactly. So right. just trying to pass or, on information or, yeah. and, and set expectations, right? Like if you get into it and you're not going to do anything with it for the next three years, it has no weighting at all. Um, this this report and comparisons would probably matter a lot more. But from a short term entry standpoint, you're absolutely right, Pierre. That's just trying to trend what we're pass on is um, kind of an overall breadth of, of where the market's at. But are you actively, do you actively discourage advisors from using this as a reweighting or reallocation or um you know tactical decision making tool like what if somebody yeah i mean if somebody comes in and looks at the you know all the green positions one through eight you, you know is do you you know do you just go there or yeah absolutely so we 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 do encourage them to use this tactically tactfully yeah. cuz you know, there's, I just there's uh, yeah, and I, I'm asking areas. you this because I'm asking you this because it sounded like you said no when 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 Mike was asking you earlier, but I, I well that was in regards yeah. to this. I don't put a lot of weighting into it from a, an actual. It okay. just it changes a lot, right? This this doesn't add a lot of value. It's more of just an information tool of kind of overbought, oversold levels for the market. Now these reports okay, so, but, add but a lot the, of value because these are where the relative strength comparisons are coming in. These are where okay. all of that analysis is coming in. And you know, I'm going to provide a negative example here, but here's banking. 
and how we've hopefully stayed away from it um, over the long haul. So if I pull it up, I can see kind of when this appears. I am on a testing site, so it's a little bit slower than reality, I apologize. So here's the sector in the, the basically March 13th, or if you want to go back further, it was already ranked 29 out of 30, right? Um, it was, and that was before the crash, or a couple of days before it, it was already 24 out of 30, right? So, but it's, it's also it's been red since December. Exactly, right? Yeah. So it's it's you know hasn't been green since you go back further or over a year, right? So October of you know 2022, and it's been on the, the kind of falling ever since. So this is a an example of how you know if you were in that sector or that exposure. Uh, again, it hasn't been as bad in Canada. Again, this is more U.S. weighted, yeah. but still, overall, it's a sector you would rather not be in and take that minus 18 percent um, hit over the last quarter, right? So, um, and that's that's on the the nice side. If um, if you did have some individual stock exposures that you know are bankrupt now or uh, even um, in that situation. So overall, what we're trying to do, okay, we're trying to point you in the right direction: aerospace and defense, metals and mining, construction electronics right like there's this is where we're trying to point people um from kind of a more gigs like 11 sectors here's kind of uh we can again even sort this and find where those best opportunities lie um or we we can even combine them together within all the materials or within all industrials and in computer or it or stuff like that and find the actual names within it so this is just a top level kind of top-down approach then we can get into this and say okay if I do want to have more exposure to materials or to IT, where should I be? Uh, or industrial seems to have quite a few names up here at the top. So that's, again, an area that most people are in the tech stocks. And like you said, Apple and some of these bigger names are more and more part of these passive indexes. So how can you stand out? How can you diversify your portfolio? Um, it's simply going here. If you don't have a lot of industrial exposure right away, we're hopefully showing a lot of ideas to point you in the right direction whether that's aerospace and defense or manufacturing, construction. Um, again, it try to save you time from finding actual insight uh, of where you want to be and then also sectors that you probably don't want to be in at all uh, going forward. So just very quick, hopefully powerful insights for advisors to dive down into a top-down approach of where should I be in the market? Okay, international. Well, we'll take a look at that next. We'll take a look at an international strategy. How can people actually take something away from this conversation today and um, go buy an ETF to get more exposure there, or I'm gonna show you an international um, five EDR strategy that's um, up like 250% over the last three years, <laughs> just using our system, just using relative yeah. strength and trying to find, um, be unbiased and rotate in and out of, of opportunities. So this is kind of how we try to empower advisors to get that information of where should I be, where should I take advantage of the opportunities and hopefully find some of these names that can add a lot of value and raise that overall um, average of, of your your models, your portfolios. Well, it takes away all that guesswork, right? I mean, it's not, you know, it, it takes away a huge amount. Of, I mean, it's a huge time saver, first of all, because you're not you're you're not. You, you, it doesn't, you know, it, it eliminates the need to sort of pander to your own biases, and and uh, you know, where should I put my money? Where should I put money for my clients? Um, you know, what are the areas I should be looking at? Just like the European example, I mean, if you just focused on the top eight, on the top eight, uh, you know, in that previous list, um, you know, you'd be avoiding all of the negatively um, ranked assets and just focusing on, on, you know, what's positively ranked from a relative strength point of view. Yep. It, it, gives, a, it gives a consistent framework yeah. to interpret the market. And, you know, for, for better or worse, I mean, relative strength is what they put on the statement every month too. So it's not the fundamentals. Um, <laughs> it's the price change over some period of time. And, um, so it, it, are there any points where you struggle? So, so the U S is a good deep market where you get mm -hmm. sectors and you've got lots of, uh, breadth within each sector in, in Canada, it's not quite the same. And how, how do you. How do you handle that in some of our gig sectors where there's fairly limited numbers? Just just an overall awareness to that sure. and you have to deal with it. How, how do you approach that problem? I'll give you one example of where a system is is not good and that's gold stocks. Um, gold gold stocks and their movement is so quick and 
usually dependent on the price of gold and the short-term opportunities, that by the time it moves into our favorite zone, if you look at this, half of the TSX 60 kind of favorite zone is in metals and mining. Now, yeah. again, that's that's been a good sector call and, and good overall, but usually that kind of movement happens quick, especially if it's gold companies and they're kind of really correlated to the price of gold. So, you know, if I went and looked at this uh, historical ranking of um, Barrick Gold, for example, you'd see a lot of volatility in this report and a lot of potentially quick, fast, actionable ideas. So that's more of a, a quick trading system <laughs> um, on, our, on our, our side of things that probably doesn't work as well as kind of the longer term calls that we're trying to do. Um, and if I, I look at this historical chart, you can kind of see what I mean. So here's a good example when it worked out in 2015, bought it at $10.44 and it rides up to $28 and leaves kind of 27. Other times it's entering quickly and exiting quickly, uh, multiple times here, even in just the end of 2022. So this is an example of a high beta, high, you know, kind of um, high volatility stock that uh, we're looking for more of the longer term opportunities. And there's, I've, I've lost money on this trade, it seems like every time, that one out of eight <laughs> times where it does really well, it can make up for all the other portfolios. But in terms of a win rate, I would say some of the higher volatility stocks, you have to have a quicker kind of a signal on that. But that's also why we try to give the ability for our users to kind of see that information, whether it's through a quick calculation like beta and see, okay, um, why am I buying Shopify if it's going to be you know, three, 300% times more the, the volatility of the benchmark that I'm trying to get into? That might not be the best strategy for everybody. Yeah. Um, and that's one example just kind of off the top of my head. And there's lots of other examples that it does very, very well getting into a tech resources and holding that for a long period of time. And it's been up in the favorite zone this whole month and, you know, returning 28%. And those kind of things are what our clients are hopefully taking advantage of, but I can't say it's always been like that. And so sometimes, yeah, that momentum or that kind of volatility can work both ways. Uh, ideally, we're looking for strong positions that are going to stay up there for a long time, but with volatile markets, it, it doesn't always stay that way. So kind of always coming back to what we're trying to do is reduce the time. Instead of looking at 60 stocks, here's about 15 to, to, to look at. And here's, you know, the maybe the top banking stock, um, which has a huge outperformance of the lowest banking stock in this report at TD. Again, I'm not the, like one or the other more than, the, more than that, but it's just kind of, if you look at those kind of relative performances, we, we can really point people in the right direction. Still is a strong yield, still good fundamentals, everything. And it's, again, the time to own that bank over the other ones. And that's every advisor in this country has <laughs> probably at least one banking stock. So we can right. add value to even those core um, important positions and then hopefully around the edges, uh, again, help you stay away from things that are going to blow up your portfolio. But, you know, <laughs> I've struggled with certain names like that that have that volatility and not that long staying power like things that are influenced outside of um, maybe strong earnings reports. It's more on the price outside the company's control. I, I just look at, at, you know, what you've just gone over with us today. And I just think, you know, why wouldn't, why, like, why wouldn't you make use of something like this since it's, you know, it's one of your core unique propositions is, is your ability to manage, you know, a, a portfolio of holdings. Um, especially when, when you have, and increased odds of doing better than than something that was subjectively put together. Yeah, I think there's two kind of reservations we get from from um, advisors, and and one is you do usually have a little bit higher trading when you're a little bit more active, trying to find yeah. because again, unless there's strong trends that last for a while, which has happened. I remember at the year 2013 is going back a little further. I don't think we made one trade in our portfolios. It seemed like our, our trade volume was so low because the trend just happened that whole year. Like it was just so strong in 2014, even in 2015, right? Like it was really low turnover. And then you get years choppy like last year where you're really trying to find that that uh, market direction or that uh, sector direction, and, or it's so quick, like January this year, tech's all in and then it's out again, right? So. Um, in, in volatile kind of markets or, or kind of choppy markets where we might be heading towards or maybe to the down a little bit, like we'll see. Um, it is a little bit more difficult to find those longer term trends. 
However, again, it is really usually good at what to stay away from. So if you even just use it on, hey, what to cut out for the portfolios, what to stay away from, you can add value from that side of things. Right. Um, but I think that's one reservation. The other is that I hear is, again, it's not necessarily fundamentally based, but it is in a way because it's taking all the information out there in the market, looking at the underlying supply and, um, supply and demand relationship and that pure analysis, right? This is doing a, a 60 by 60 kind of pure analysis on each of the, the stocks in, in this universe. Right. And, you know, we have the Russell 1000, we have the S&P 500 that you can go to on the US side and, and look at 500 companies against each other. And again, hopefully point in the right direction. So some of it's but, just not believing in technical analysis, but really what we do is not, it is technical analysis, but it's looking at the underlying kind of price movement comparison. And, and, and that's sometimes it's a little bit harder to wrap your head around, but not necessarily from a, um, fundamental level. It's just, uh, it's something different, right? I think there's a couple of reasons to, uh, Pierre, if I might jump in on it. It's, sure. So, so what is, what are we harnessing here? We're harnessing the investment factor that is momentum, right? You're, you're looking at the things that are performing better. And the assumption is when they generally perform better, that tends to continue. And that's reflected in, in, in research, largely large scale research uh, over long periods of time, whether it's French pharma, et cetera. And so you, you do have some underlying academic reason for this to have existed and to persist to exist um, through time. It's also harder, right? So what were we talking about earlier? Mr. Jones, I'm gonna buy some France. Mm -hmm. he, doesn't, he doesn't drive by French banks or French yeah. phone companies on his way home. He doesn't see French grocers. He does drive by all those Canadian stores when he's coming home in Canada, and he does get a lot of input from U.S. media as we sit here in Canada. And so there's a much greater degree of comfort with those things because the familiarity, that's what creates these home country biases. That's yeah. what creates the, the home continent bias, if you will, because we do sit beside the largest um, uh, uh, financial market in the world. So all of these things have barriers of comfort. They are discomfort, they're uncomfortable, and especially in the times when they're kind of more rewarding, when the story's new, when these things are emergent, when no one else, none of your friends has them in the portfolio. So of course it's hard, it's hard. It's hard to sell them, it's hard to buy them, and then it's, it's you're down 10% and, and the facts have changed. It's no longer an area of outperformance. It's become an area of underperformance and so you have to sell it. But when it's in an area of underperformance and you have a hundred percent rate of return and it's still there, mm -hmm. you probably still want to hold it. You might have to rebalance. You want to beat those winners to death and you want to cut those losers short. And again, you're right. having that framework and just doing that, beating the winners to death and cutting the losers short is the exact opposite of what most people do or what they want to do. And so it, it goes against so many sort of embedded investor preferences and those preferences are not preferences that optimize the higher returns there uh, they optimize the lower returns take small gains and keep large losses that that doesn't work so again there's there's a I lot mean, of behavioral reasons why something like this systematically going through and and sort of applying it over and over again can have some persistent success but you've got to stick to it it's like any, it's like a lot of things. You just, there's a lot of ways yeah. to do this. Yeah. You've got to stick to it and it's hard, not easy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, I think, I think if you're going to commit to doing something like, you know, using, using a tool like, like this, you really have to be all in. You can't, you know, you have to, mm -hmm. you kind of have to adopt it. Right. I mean, you have to, it's, well, I, 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 I don't I'll know. I'll push back Maybe. here. I'll push back a little bit. Remember what we talked about earlier with the tracking error. So yeah. the amount of medicine that the allocator or the individual client can tolerate, right? The amount of extra performance in these odd things that helps provide a little boost is what you, or reduces risk is what you have to do. And that's going to vary by client. And you could have a big passive portfolio where 10% is doing this. Well, the fees are going to reflect that, you know, so someone's fee conscious, that's fine. What's the overall fee if you're adding some exposure to active management like this, right? So you've got to think about it holistically. You got to think about it from the client's perspective and how they're going to be able to adapt to it. So I agree that you could, you could go wholeheartedly into this, 
But then you're really selecting a group of clients or individuals who are investors that are also wholeheartedly into this. If they're not, if they're always with their buddies comparing their bank stocks, they are going to fire you and you don't own any bank stocks, even though the bank yeah. stocks are down. So you don't, I mean, you don't, okay, so you don't have to use the tool this way. It's like you have model portfolios too, right? You have, you have uh, different levels of use. And I mean, all of the information that's available in SI charts is incredibly useful. Like, you know, if you want to drill down or confirm or, or, or look into relative strength of, a, you know, any individual position, but you can, you can obviously also go and build a portfolio and have, and have SIA direct the relative strength of the portfolio as well. Yeah. I mean, our, our goal, our mission statement is to empower advisors to make better decisions for their clients and to hopefully save them time right. from research that they're spending elsewhere. Right. Because, you know, if you. I can look up any symbol you give me and within 10 seconds tell you how I feel about it versus all its peer groups and all its universes, um, an overall kind of long-term rank and short-term rank, right? That, that's how fast and easy it can be. And to your point, Pierre, we can also create hypothetical models that are up 122% in 2021 or 129% in 2020, right? Or up 20% this year in the international side, right? When international is strong, here's the kind of high high trade i know it's not uh, for the faint of heart like you're talking about there is the fees of, of more trades more tactically allocating towards that but the payoff can be high for that kind of stuff and this is not actually a model i suggest for people because it's so crazy but it's it's the value of the system but yeah what's cool paul is that you can cater to any kind of client if you have a client who wants to have a portfolio of 10 or 15 stocks you can do that and you can give them you can give them the lowdown on any stock they're asking about um but you can also you, you can also i mean i i can see where there's so many ways to use the tool to uh, you know either go along with a client who wants to be a stock uh, you know an active stock picker or uh even use the tool to dissuade somebody from being an active stock picker as well because you know, they could come to you and say, I want to buy some of these, I want to buy some shares in these companies that I had, that I like. And then, you know, turns out, you know, six out of 10 names, you shouldn't even be looking at right now. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's used in a lot of ways and, and you don't even have to fully believe in the way that we do things or relative strength in general. All we're trying to do is again, be that market intelligence software for them, portfolio management software as well that can create models, create portfolios, um, simplify their life with alerts and um, scanning and you know, all, the, all the things that you can do. We, we were looking at the reports page. We run almost 600 reports every single day on every market out there, all the ETFs uh, that are, are traded, all the mu mutual funds, all the stocks and the ability to create your own custom based on your own research. So a lot of things that I try to do with advisors is not say, hey, our, our way is the only way to do it because I don't even believe that. There's There's so many great investment systems and tools out there that um, if I were an advisor, I'd be using a fundamental screen and picking high quality stocks, right? And then overlay on top of it for kind of the timing more of, hey, this could be a great value stock, but others don't realize the value yet, right? So let's focus on these stocks right now or something as simple for people that just want to plug and play like, hey, what are the top five names in the TSX 60 diversified by sector? There you go. Here's kind of a, an alpha overlay tactically on top of what they're already doing for their clients and probably already holding a bunch of the names they, they will for the next 10 years, right? But here's how you can add a little extra alpha on this side. Or again, I think the focus on today is the international side, which is we're working on a couple different international models that probably will be launched in the next couple of weeks. Uh, again, kind of a sector rotation of, or country rotation one. And that's not going to be for everybody, but just a way to give yourself that exposure and help yourself stand out um, and hopefully add more alpha to the, the client's uh, portfolio overall. So it can be, like you said, very small piece or we work with some advisors, that's a large piece of their business. So um, and again, we just try to create tools for them to hopefully make their life easier. So I got a question for you, Paul. Like you've, you've, you, you've talked to thousands of advisors. What is the, what would you say is the universal um you know, aha for advisors getting onto SIA charts. Like, 
what's the like hands down what is the the most valuable thing what is the thing that advisors think is most valuable about SIA charts like what are the, what is like the go-to thing that advisors use the most probably the models that I'm looking at um, there's not another software out there that I know of there's other softwares that do modeling but to quickly and powerfully take a model like um, whatever they're doing for their clients and get the kind of analytics and analysis um, for it um, is, is definitely an area we put a lot of strength or a lot of time in and focus on because we want to make sure that um, people can tell their story right the most um, successful advisors that I know are really good at marketing and really good at telling their story usually a differentiated story and again they could have a lot of strengths in different areas and a good team around them and all this but we want to help them tell their story and their uh, thing so that's where this comes in saying okay well, this is not an updated model but if if this was it we can you know quickly um, create a, a powerful report to track their their history their buys and sells um, to help them tell their story inputting their logos all that kind of stuff their their templates in the system and then the other aspect is just trying to simplify technical analysis relative strength it's very complicated we didn't even really get into it but what we're trying to do is um, save people a lot of time on that research side, point them in the right direction, and really where we've added the most value is not always what to buy, but what to stay away from. We, that's where we started with on our conversation. That's our biggest value add from a risk management standpoint. You look at any advisor or they talk to you at the end of their career, they'll probably say that one of their top three things they did the best for their clients is um, is just their risk management, right? If, if somebody has... $10 million and they just sold their business, they don't necessarily want to make another 10 million. Of course, everybody wants that. What they absolutely don't want is that 10 million to turn into 1 million or turn into zero, right? The risk management is so important. It's it's not talked about enough. And it's, I think, kind of a core competency that we try to provide for our clients so that you can still have this outperformance um, and this growth, but also what matters more to us is this, right? What is your your, your value versus the risk you're taking on, right? Are you taking on more risk and is it actually providing that value? Uh, are you reducing your drawdowns? Are you uh, increasing your, your your total capture ratio, right? Like that's the kind of analytics that we run on your individual set of trades and models that we can help promote and, and help kind of show to the client. So this is something that people love. And again, it's just a, a tool or one of many tools out there, but we, we just have a passion for helping advisors and empowering them to make the best decisions they can to raise their average. <laughs> and that's another thing, right? They can work with you as much or as little as they want. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, we have different levels. We've created different versions of our, our system, um, you know, with different plans so that, you know, there's not a one size fits all. We get it. There's advisors that are, are professional. They want everything. All those models that we talked about. Great. There you go. You just want kind of the research heavy. I want all the reports. I want the the stock rankings. I want the models, um, but don't need to tell your story or you already have a solution for that. Great. Or we've come out with kind of a, a lower tier, more aimed at kind of MFT advisors that just want ETF and mutual fund kind of rankings or that kind of just top down approach um, still with uh, this kind of still support and, and, and those kind of things. So yeah, we're, we're trying to you know, expand on, on what people are doing. And we're really excited about kind of what's to come in our company. And kind of, again, I know your product tool that will simplify the compliance nightmare, their, their headache at different firms too, uh, we hope, um, with some powerful peer comparison reports and didn't have time to get into that today, but that's a, an area that we're, again, just trying to improve the overall kind of experience that advisor has. But again, uh, we, we love working with advisors and uh, each each one that I talk to has their own unique setup and their own values. And, and again, it's my delight of, of joining in with them and saying, okay, well, let's help tell your story and what you're good at and, um, and or their own research, right? Um, you know, their own company research or their own research they've created and working within their constraints of their con confines. So that's, again, a rewarding experience on my end and my team. Um, and then I'm working with the development staff of, creating new tools and features all the time. That's a, that's a, a huge area and then fun experience for me too. Paul, thank you so much. That was, uh, you know, that's very enlightening. I think, I think it's such a, it's such a, uh, a rich tool 
it's not, you know, I, I, I always find every time we, you know, we talk about this, um, not only like, I mean, it was always a rich tool, but it's, it, it, you know, as you add features, it gets richer and richer. And I think it requires, it deserves the time. I think there, there's a lot here for advisors that's, that's, um, you know, very, very useful. I think probably one of the underestimated parts of what you're doing is the support that you give to it. It's not just a piece of software of sign up for it and then figure it out yourself. Um, it's very, um, it's very hands-on. There's onboarding, right? You guys spend a fair bit of time with advisors at the beginning and then, and then consistently throughout and as, as, you know, as much support as they need until they're up and running. And then they can always turn back or lean back on you when, when they've got a question about how to make use of it. I think, I think that's probably more valuable or as valuable as the tool itself. Cause I think, I think without that high touch that you offer, um, you know, it, it has, it runs the risk of falling flat because it can get very complicated or, or there's, there's so much or it's overwhelming. Maybe the, the amount of information and, and reporting that's available and tools that are available can be overwhelming that you don't know where to start. But if you've got a good guide and, you know, you've got your team in there helping advisors to provide that guidance and lead them through the process. Anyway, I, I think it's worthwhile talking about it. We will definitely have to continue uh, down that, you know, down that path with you yep. in, in uh, subsequent episodes. But Paul, wonderful to have you today. Thanks. Really enjoy, always enjoy talking to you. There's always so much to, uh, to dive into and, and uh, you know, it'll be fun to get into the weeds with you on some of the other. Uh, it's always a uh, pleasure. We've had a long relationship yeah. and Mike, it's always good to chat as well. And um, you know, we, really do try to meet advisors where they are, like you said, and, and try to empower them. It's, it's a really complicated thing to simplify technical analysis and simplify that you have to have the in-depth capabilities. So we want to provide that, but also, you know, there's a lot more call from advisors of just, Hey, show me a model, show me, show me to simplify that my life. And so we focusing more on that side, I would say that's a bigger focus for us over the next six months to provide more kind of models and point them in the right direction. And, um, and again, all our ultimate goal is to empower them to, to make better decisions. So you gotta, gotta be able to simplify it and provide the in-depth, which uh, is always a hard line to, to walk through. But advisors can call you like just yeah. out of the, you know, I need help. Yeah, show, show me, I've got, a, I've got a client coming at four o'clock. Show me how to do this, right? Yeah, we've got a great I mean, support some, team yeah, and account exactly. managers to, to help advisors. And we're not just some, uh, computer software with uh, no face to the name, right? And um, you, yeah, you can't call you, you can't call Salesforce yeah. and ask them for that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't I ever know right. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Yeah, great chatting, Paul. Amazing. Yeah. Where, where Thanks, can people Paul. find you, I guess? I, I don't know. Yeah. Sure. SIHarts.com or what would... Yeah, exactly. SIHarts.com is the easiest way. We're on LinkedIn. We're on uh, Twitter. Uh, YouTube as well. Um, you can follow us uh, there. Um, and again, um, appreciate your guys' time today. And um, yeah, uh, just happy to to chat with you guys and looking forward to the next one. I'd love to come on on a quarterly basis and um, yeah, kind of share some insights and keep it a little shorter for everybody too if you want and just dive right into it. <laughs>